Good morning, movers. Welcome to today's live coaching session. Today we're talking all about fat loss. Okay, we're going to talk about some of the basics of fat loss. I want to differentiate a little bit this morning between fat loss and weight loss, just so we know that there is a difference. All right, we'll talk a little bit about the science of fat loss, a little bit about that, some of the misconceptions. All right, common misconceptions, and then also some strategies for fat loss for yourself. So we are delving deep into this topic today. Uh, let me know in the comments below if it's something on your agenda currently. Are you looking to lose body fat? Um, am I? I'm looking to lose a little bit. Sure. <laughs> it's just, it always happens. It comes right around, sort of right around that middle section, right? So I'm not exempt either just because we move daily and work out uh it it happens and sometimes it's about dialing in some of those basic principles that we often let go by the wayside uh do you do that like you know in your head what you need to do and yet sometimes the strategies elude you <laughs> that happens to me as well so it's good for all of us to revisit some of the basic principles or first principles when it comes to fat loss uh, so let's just take a look at it first what is fat loss specifically? Well, this is your weight lost from fat in your body. So the scale may not go down, right? But your body composition will certainly shift. And this is a, a strategy that uh, a lot of people lose when you, or, sorry, use when you don't want to lose muscle. You just want to get more lean, right? But sustain your lean muscle tissue that you've worked hard at building. So this will focus again on maintaining the lean muscle. Oftentimes, if you're trying to lose body fat, your calorie deficit is not going to be as grand as it, uh, as it is if you're just trying to lose weight. All right. So we're minimal in our calorie deficit. You might only have a deficit of about 200 calories per day instead of the traditional 500 or sometimes people even do even grander than that. So you're really taking your time with this and giving your, yourself a number of months in order to accomplish this fat loss. Uh, of course, you want to use sustainable eating strategies, right? Including whole foods, mindful eating, intuitive eating. I think those are all really important. You don't necessarily want to go into something that's really restrictive in order to attain that goal. Um, just because it's not sustainable for the long haul, right? So there are a lot of sustainable strategies that you can turn the dial up on in order to achieve your fat loss goal. Uh, what we don't want is any of the crash dieting. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment here too. So that's fat loss. Well, what is weight loss? This is a decrease in your overall body weight. And it can come actually from losing fat, from losing muscle, and from losing water as well. So, you know, you, you could have... Sometimes we'll step on the scale and all of a sudden we're down two, three, four pounds. And you're like, how did that happen? Well, it could be a loss of a lot of things. Again, muscle, fat, but also water weight as well. So this can be achieved by being in a calorie deficit, but a lot of times people will go on a weight loss diet and they don't really care about the foods that they choose, right? So you can choose foods that are packaged, pre-packaged. A lot of people, you know, back in a couple of years ago, I was training a number of clients who all wanted to do the ideal protein diet, which is all packaged foods. And so you are on a minimal, you know, <laughs> calorie diet. It was high in protein. So I'll give them that, which was a benefit, but it was still all packaged. So when you do that, you're, you're choosing foods that we already now know are not going to be super beneficial for your gut health, right? Because they're processed, they're packaged They're You can't pick, chase or grow them. Man has made them. And so it's, it's not as beneficial for maybe other targets that you have for yourself. So always keep that in mind when you're looking to reduce your body fat percentages. What are the foods that I'm choosing that will also align with my other targets? Am I eating for longevity? Yes, then I'm going to have lots of plants and maybe more plant-based protein. Am I eating for muscle uh, increase? Then yes, I'm going to make sure that my pro protein is adequate. Am I eating for reducing inflammation? Then I'm going to choose foods from the Mediterranean diet, right? So always be thinking in the back of your brain that um, you've got those other targets as well. Stacy says, I noticed an increase in my hunger during the March meltaway. Um, registration now closed. <laughs> she linked it. Uh, 
Well, you know, when we reduce our calories, we definitely can increase hunger. But also when we increase our caloric expenditure, right, we can increase hunger. But this is really specific to the person. So there's kind of this rule of uh, thumb that says, if you are someone who gets really, really hungry, right, and you, you like to eat a lot, then you might be better increasing your calorie deficit if fat loss is a goal for you vis-a-vis -vis exercise, okay? You must spend more time exercise and you'll burn more and then you can eat the same amount. If hunger is not an issue for you, but you're kind of a lazy person, you don't want to do that much exercise, then you focus more on what you're eating, right? Then you can reduce the caloric intake. So what am I? Uh, I'm probably... I, I'm, I don't get super hungry, so I'd, I'd probably be, you know, I can manage my intake through the food and not have to kick up my expenditure through the exercise. But it is, you know, it's going to be different for everyone, so that's important to note. All right, so weight loss, again, focuses on calorie restriction. It often can include excess cardio. A lot of people use a lot of excess cardio without any resistance training, which is a mistake because you're going to possibly be burning up some of that muscle, right? Um, oftentimes a calorie deficit will be 500 calories a day or greater. Um, lots of times there's restrictive diets and people will often have low energy or fatigue because they're eating so little, right? And any movement or action or activity that we do do oftentimes is using our muscle as fuel, right? So if you don't have a lot of glycogen or carbohydrates in the body, your body can move into that fat burning. Once that sort of tapped and it's looking for fuel, but you haven't really fed it, it does go into using your muscle as fuel. That is a fuel source. So that is something we want to avoid. And you can avoid that by ensuring that you have adequate protein intake, right? And ensuring that you also don't have a drastic deficit, like five 500 calories or more. You keep the deficit shorter, like somewhere in that 200 calories and that you do resistance training and you're very consistent with that. Okay. So those are really important elements. If you don't want to eat away at your muscle, you've got to do those things. Uh, let's look at a little bit of the science of fat loss. Okay. The science is based on the principles of energy balance and metabolism. Your metabolism is the rate at which your body burns calories for fuel. Okay. We know already that as we age, it slows down. That sucks, but there are some things that we can do to make, you know, elevate it back up. And lifting weights is really important. Eating foods that are um, can be have a thermic effect, so help our metabolism increase, like protein, is really important as well. Energy balance is the relationship between the calories you consume and the calories that you burn. So when you consume more calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. And when you burn more calories than you consume, you're going to lose weight. So that energy balance is really important to understand. And yeah, when people tell me, well, I, I eat X, Y, and Z, and I'm just not losing weight. My, you know, the scale hasn't budged at all, or I'm not losing any fat. Uh, chances are that you don't know exactly the amount that you're eating. That's the default. You, you probably are eating more than you think. In which case, we bring in different strategies like tracking that can help you be a little bit more accurate so you can actually see what you're eating. Now, that's one element. Of course, hormones play a big part of this. Your amount of sleep that you have plays a big part of this. The amount of stress that you carry plays a big part of this, right? So whether or not your estrogen is depleted plays a big part of this. So those all of that also has a big impact on to whether or not you're losing weight. So I would take a look at all of that. First things first though, your basic principle, I would look at your energy input versus your energy output. Are you consuming more than you're burning? Uh, and I've, I've done a lot of talks on this on sort of how to find what your basal metabolic rate is, which means the rate at which your body burns calories for fuel if you did nothing. So how many calories can I eat today if I sat on the couch and watched Netflix. Uh, so you can go to the Harris Benedict calculator, of course, and calculate that in. And, you know, it might say something like 
for me, I don't know, I think it's like 13 or 1400 calories, 1400 or 1500, maybe somewhere in there. So if I did nothing else and I just wanted to maintain, that's what I would eat. Now, I'm working out a lot though. So I'm hiking, I'm walking, right? I'm working out. Uh, so you can add in your, your workout amount there, which means that you can eat more food. So it bumps it up to 2000 calories as my, um, as my amount that I'm allowed to have. Now, if I want to be, if I want to lose weight, now I have to be in a deficit of that 2000 calories. So a slow weight loss or fat loss would be a deficit of 200, a little bit faster would be in a deficit of 500. Uh, Kim says, what impact does NEAT have? Can it meaningfully contribute? You know what? I do have a whole section about that. I will get to that because that it, it definitely can contribute. So um, stay tuned. It's about a 5 to 10% impact on your daily expenditure. Uh, but I'll, I'll visit some of those percentages in just a second here. So back up to here. Wait for it. Yes. So your metabolism, again, refers to the chemical process that occurs in the body to convert food into energy. And uh, that can be divided into two parts, catabolism and anabolism, right? Catabolism breaks down complex molecules into simpler ones, okay? So catabolism is the breakdown of energy and anabolism is used to build. So I've said this before that it's very challenging to be both at the same time. So if you're trying to lose fat, you need to be in that catabolic state. If you're trying to build muscle, you need to be in that anabolic state. So for us to be both at the same time, it's like, how do you do it? How do you break down and build? Well, if you want to do both simultaneously, you have to keep them sort of as close to each other as you can, which means you need to make the deficit really tiny in the fat loss component, and you really need to be diligent about upping the protein and the resistance training in the anabolic department so that they're not miles apart, but they're quite close together, all right? So then you begin to lose fat and sustain or even gain muscle. Although you're not going to gain a lot if you're not eating in a surplus, okay? Just understand that. But at least you won't lose muscle. So that's important to note as well. The most significant factor in fat loss is the rate at which your body burns calories, all right? This rate is known as your basal metabolic rate. And of course, it's impacted by things like your age, your sex, your body composition, your genetics. These are some of the internal factors. I talked about this in a coaching call from... Uh, content from Dr. Stuart uh, Phillips. He says there's a lot of internal factors, things that we don't really have a lot of control over, but then there are external factors, uh, levers that we can pull that we do have control over. So sometimes there is a genetic predisposition to how your body burns fat. So remember that. Uh, your basal metabolic rate though accounts for about 60 to 70% of the total calories burned in a day. Okay, 60 to 70 percent of the total burned. Now, Dr. Abby Smith writes, muscle requires a lot of calories to rebuild and regenerate. So during nighttime, you're likely burning more. Uh, hormones also can influence your metabolism, right? So how do we break that down? What are the things that we can do throughout the day that can help us increase our fat burning quotient? Well, again, your resting metabolic rate is going to account for 70%. If you're just lying on the couch doing nothing, that is worth 70%, okay? And, and some of the big contributors of that are actually the breath, the energy that the brain uses, right? Our, our brain requires a lot of fuel and energy. And sleep. Body composition changes are also take up energy. Um, and, uh, sorry, body temperature changes. So if we go outside or if it's cold, our body's going to burn more energy than if it's really hot, right? Uh, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis has about a 5 to 10% impact on your daily expenditure. So that's actually quite substantial if you're doing everything sort of you know you can, but you haven't really increased your NEAT, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So it's five to 10%. So what if you did everything you could, you're not really losing fat, but now you're just going to add some neat to the equation. Well, you would increase your 
caloric burn by about 5 to 10%. And that can include things like walking, but it's also things like having a standing desk, taking a standing call, fidgeting. Like I'm constantly, uh, I bounce my leg a lot, but when the dog is on my lap in the evening, I kind of rock her with my legs, which is funny. But I know that it's it's kind of like a, I don't want to say a nervous tick, but it makes me feel soothed. I know it makes her feel soothed. And it's, it's burning energy by those little movements. So Dr. Andrew Huberman does an actual very intense conversation on the art of fidgeting and how much expenditure, uh, caloric expenditure we can have when we just fidget our body, move our muscles, move our neck, move our legs, bounce our knee. All of that uh, is included as non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Of course, things like taking the stairs instead of the escalator, um, laundry, doing the dishes, mopping the floor, gardening, all of that is important. So even if you just started adding that in every day, you would increase your overall percentage by about five to 10%. Uh, The second thing that can increase your daily expenditure and help you lose fat is that thermic effect of food. It's called TEF, okay, your thermic effect of food. And that's again, about a five to 10% impact according to Dr. Abby Smith. And this includes eating foods that are going to increase our metabolic rate. So something like protein takes 30% 30 of the calories you consume, it takes that much to break it down. So for every 100 calories that you eat, you're going to be burning 30 calories to break that food down. So protein is very metabolic which is why a lot of people say to prioritize protein when you are beginning to diet down, right? If you're wanting to um, reduce your body fat uh, because it is has such a high thermic effect of food, higher than carbs and higher than fat. And then, so that's about five to 10%. And then exercise has another five to 10% impact on our daily uh, expenditure. So that's 70% for your basal metabolic rate, five to 10% for your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, five to 10% for your thermic effect of food, and five to 10% for your exercise impact. All right, so that's important to know because all of those little things can add up tremendously. Um, As your estrogen drops, and a lot of us are in that phase of life where that's happening right now, right? Pre-menopause, menopause, menopause, post-menopause, a lot of us have depleted that, And unless you're taking uh, like a BHRT or HRT, you're going to have lower levels. And so when that level drops, when that hormone drops, we don't burn as much fat as we used to, right? So it's important that we stay in that fat burning, if that is a target of yours, by keeping your glucose levels lower, right? Otherwise, your body will be burning glucose at rest and not fat stores. Now, if you were part of our March Melt Away or you listened to some of the coaching calls from there, we did talk about strategies to not have those elevated glucose spikes. And of course, uh, the queen of that is the glucose goddess. And so if you followed her or follow her, you can do that on Instagram or Facebook or even buy the book, The Glucose Goddess, what's it called? The Glucose Revolution. She talks about all of the hacks uh, that we can implement super simple things that we can implement in our eating order, right? How we pair our food, what we pair it with, um, even taking walks after dinner and how that will help us to offset those high glucose spikes. When we have lots of estrogen, our estrogen helps us with those spikes. When estrogen is lower, all of a sudden we don't have that help any longer. So we have to take the reins back And we do that by switching our eating order, protein first, right? Or vegetables first, maybe with some vinegar on it, protein and fat, and then carbohydrates last can help offset that big spike. All right. So those are important things. If you're wanting to, you know, lose body fat, just tweaking a few of those things can can really make a big difference. So... Extreme weight loss, of course, isn't the answer. And so often I I feel like a lot of people want to lose fat or weight fast. And so they do a real 
drastic calorie deficit in order to do that. And it works. Of course it works because your body's starving, right? And so it's going to eat up all of the fuel that you have in it. And not only just the fat stores and the glycogen stores, but also the muscle in order to sustain itself. So it's, it's not super obviously sustainable. And if you've tried it before, you've probably done a crash diet or an extreme diet where you've lost a lot of weight. And then a year later or six months later, or whenever you get tired of doing that, you're back at the same place again. Okay. Uh, when we decrease our calorie intake significantly, the body preserves fat stores very efficiently. It's like, hold on to this. Uh, since insulin is low, thyroid hormone production is decreased. And with this, the resting metabolism is lowered. Okay. And this actually can take place within 24 hours of starting an extreme diet like that. So it's a strategy that is bound to give you that rebound weight as soon as you stop the diet. So it really is not a st strategy that is recommended at all. You're better off understanding the body and choosing a strategy that's sustainable for the long haul. Uh, let's talk about the types of fat that we have and which type is important to begin to be conscious and aware of that we don't want a lot of. Uh, so there's four types. You have that subcutaneous fat, which is the fat right underneath the skin. It's, a, it's the fat that you can pinch. Uh, there's the visceral fat, which is kind of lower into the body cavity. It's around our vital organs, and it is the dangerous fat. It is not the fat that we want, okay? We have some intramuscular fat. Uh, you can tell if there's a lot of intramuscular fat if, you know, like a, look at a, a steak, for an example. You can have uh, a prime rib, which is very fatty, and you can see the fat marbled throughout the meat, right? Or you could have a very lean cut, like a filet or a, what's a lean cut? Round, I guess, round roast. Um, so it's, it's fat, again, that when we carry a higher percentage can go into our muscle as well and not, not great. Uh, there is a good kind of fat, though, and that's our brown fat. Brown fat is rich in mitochondria. This is fat that's found around the neck, uh, the armpits, the groin. Uh, babies have a lot of brown fat, which help them regulate their body temperature now, we can increase our brown fat by that cold exposure, right? Going out into something cold, uh, inducing that shivering, which is also a fidgeting technique to in increase our non-exercise activity thermogenesis. But it also demands that our body produce more of this brown fat, again, which is rich in mitochondria. That's the energy cell or energy component of our cell. And it can make our body increase our metabolic rate and burn more fat. So sounds bad, get more brown fat, but it's actually super beneficial. And people who live in colder climates uh, actually have more brown fat on them. But again, you can increase that by doing things like cold exposure, um, having you know a cold plunge, cold showers, exposing yourself to cold when you're outside and that sort of thing. All right, so what are some effective strategies for fat loss? Well, let's look at these. Of course, it's got to involve having a calorie deficit, which means consuming fewer calories than you burn. So it can be achieved through diet and exercise, of course, and here are some ways that you can do it. Uh, understanding that caloric restriction, number one. Like, so that's going to be very important, just understanding calorie restriction. And again, important that you don't overdo the amount of restriction that you're going to do. So... I say yeah, typically anywhere between that 250 calories a day and the 500 calories a day is typically good. And it depends on how much weight you have to lose as well. If you had a large amount to lose, you know, then going at the 500 might be something that's very sustainable for you. Depends on your body size as well. Okay, but if you're really jonesing to keep your lean muscle tissue, then it's important that you do not make that deficit too drastic and that you keep it really close. Like I said, that catabolic has to be close to the anabolic, okay? Uh, number two, consuming a high 
protein diet can increase your satiety and reduce your appetite, leading to a reduction in calorie intake. So really focusing on prioritizing protein and controlling carbs. I did a whole coaching call on this, which I can link and you can go back and listen to that. How do we prioritize protein? How do I get enough protein in throughout all of my meals? How do I control carbs and yet not vilify carbs? Like carbs are super important. They're important for as an energy source. They're important for satisfaction and satiety, but it could just mean switching the order of your carbs. It could mean the amount that you're eating needs to be reduced slightly. Okay. It could mean, it could mean you're finding carbs that are lower on the glycemic index. So you're getting your carbs, but they're not going to spike your insulin as much, right? They're not going to increase that sugar load in the body. So all of those things are really important as well, but prioritizing protein is definitely going to uh, to be a way that, um, yeah, that you can increase your reduction in your calories. Uh, number three, resistance training. I do see some questions. I'll get to that in two seconds here. Resistance training can help you build lean muscle, of course, which is going to increase your basal metabolic rate. Um, if you've been with me for a while, I know that you're going to hear me say this a million times, but as we increase our resistance training, pick up heavy things and tear the muscle fibers, when we do that, the body needs to repair that. And so it looks for fuel in the body to make those repairs happen. And by virtue of that process, your body is increasing the amount of energy that you use to, to heal and repair the muscles. So when you spend time resistance training, your body's going to be more metabolic afterward, right? So even 24 to 48 hours post uh, session, your body's still burning energy because it's in that reparation mode. All right, resistance training. Yes, good. Uh, high intensity interval training can help as well. This is, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when we talk about cardio for fat loss this week later on. So I'm not going to go into depth here, but High intensity intervals involves short bursts of high intensity exercise followed by rest periods. And this type of training has been shown to increase your basal metabolic rate and to also promote fat loss. Okay, so that's something that can be included. Um, and then finally, sleep. Getting enough sleep is going to be essential for fat loss because sleep can disrupt those ghrelin and leptin hormones substantially, all right, which are going to impact your appetite. So quickly, when we have under the re um, recommended amount of sleep, so we're having somewhere in four to five hours instead, you're going to have increased levels of ghrelin and lower levels of leptin. So ghrelin's the go hormone. It's going to make you feel like whatever you've eaten is not satisfying, right? It's going to make us feel snacky and want more snacks and treats in the afternoon. When you have a good amount of sleep, that's seven to eight hours, you're going to have an increase in leptin, which is the stop hormone, okay? Again, foods that you eat will feel satisfying. You'll feel like you've had enough and you'll feel like you'll, you have the capacity to stop. So sleep impacts that substantially. So if you're not getting enough sleep and you're like wondering why you're so snacky, it could very well be a reason right there. Uh, some common misconceptions here. Actually, let's just go to the questions here so that I don't, uh, I know what we're talking about here. Uh, I hope my wild swimming will help my brown fat. Yes. It totally will help your brown fat. I've told that to Joe and Margaret, two of our members who are cold water swimmers as well. Um, so that is that is good. Uh, Kirsten asks, does visceral fat convert into brown fat? I don't know. It doesn't. It, they're two different components. Your visceral fat, um, no, because the brown fat's in different areas too. Brown fat, again, is found uh, behind the neck right armpits, groin, and your visceral fat is more deep within the organs. So I think you can just build brown fat as your body fights to bring itself back to homeostasis. So when you're shivering or you're cold, um, it, it increases so that it can regulate your body temperature. That's one of the big functions of it. And yeah, different place than where your, your visceral fat is. How is visceral fat measured? Um, I would say through like a DEXA scan or something like that. When I do body fat testing with the calipers, we're not really pinching visceral fat, right? Um, visceral fat is not pinchable. And I could tell that like I'd, I'd do the caliper testing on some men that had the big 
drum belly and it wasn't pinchable. So I just knew that was all visceral fat in there. So um, they can do, you know, you can have get an average maybe of, if you do like a BMI test on your height and weight, but a DEXA scan would definitely go through the body and be able to measure that. But the calipers is measuring more your subcutaneous fat. Uh, also a hydrostatic tank would measure your visceral fat as well. So that used to be the gold medal standard, I think before the DEXA scan came. I actually did hop into a hydrostatic tank before. You expel all of your air and then you're underneath the water getting weighed. And so it's it's a challenging way to do it because you can't have any air in your lungs and it's hard to hold your breath when you don't have any breath in there. But I found, and I measured my caliper test, body fat test to, against the hydrostatic tank and the percentage of body fat that I carried at the time was actually quite similar. But again, more of a gold medal standard uh, than of course the DEXA scan is as well. Okay, Kim says, correct me, but I don't believe it does as it is in different places within the body and I don't think it can change type. Yes, okay, good, Kim, exactly, exactly. Okay, so let's just talk about some common misconceptions and we'll end with this. So there's several common misconceptions about fat loss, including spot reduction. So a lot of people will ask me for exercises to get rid of this, to get rid of this. And I actually have a trouble spot workout coming out next week, but I always preface that by saying, these are exercises that can build muscle in these areas, but if you wanna reduce fat in this area and a reduction in your body fat percentage is going to be important. And your body's going to reduce fat wherever it chooses first. <laughs> and last. Uh, so if your body wants to reduce fat on your thighs last, then that's what it's going to do. And depending on how lean you're willing to get, you may not, you may never see that, right? I was lean enough once to have lean thighs where they didn't jiggle once in my life. And what it took to get down to that lean, uh, lower body fat percentage is something I'm not willing to ever do again. So there is that cost to being lean and you have to determine whether or not it's worth it for you because it does take a diligent um, attention to all of the things that we mentioned, to understanding hormones, to understanding sleep is crucial, to understanding um, your macronutrient balancing, like all of those things have to be dialed in all of the time in order for you to maintain that. And for some of us, you might will be willing to do that and want to do that and that is fine, but know that you don't have to do that, right? It's it's not totally necessary if you if you don't want to. So so we think about this spot reduction and we think, well, I want to lose fat in this area. Um and so my advice is always that as you deplete your body fat percentage, all of the areas of fat will begin to eventually deplete and wherever it is on your body, it'll deplete the most first and then, you know, other parts will deplete last. And so if you're willing to get lean enough, you might see those places deplete. Now, there was a conversation with Dr. Andrew Huberman where he talked a little bit about spot reduction and he sort of challenged the thought about spot reduction with this comment. This is what he said. Oh, uh, did he do? Huberman claims that switching up your movements and not allowing your body to adapt to the same movement is key if you wanna target specific fat pads. If your body is used to the same exercises, targeting the same areas, the body stops burning fat in those areas. So, ergo, different activities can target different or stubborn fat pads. I thought that was really interesting and it really does make sense. If I'm continuously doing the same routine, day in, day out, week in, week out, there are going to be some minor muscles or specific areas of my larger muscles that aren't going to be targeted the same unless I switch up the way I'm doing the exercises. So I think this is part and parcel why I like to do so many combinations of exercises. And you know, even in the beginner stream, I have a lot of those big and little muscle groups. I used to do so many of the little muscle groups like, little little movements right that you're like oh it's not a big muscle group movement but it's a little movement that might help target a, another area 
in that region that I haven't been targeting with my big muscle movements. So think about that. I thought that was interesting that he said that, but generally speaking, you're not going to be able to go, oh, I just want to lose weight off my hips. Uh, what do I, what exercise do I do? That's never the case. Okay. I want to lose weight off my hips. What calorie deficit do I need to be in and for how long in order to see that deplete? Because it would deplete if you got lean enough. That's the thing, right? Like think of people who have been restricted from food, right? People in even concentration camps who aren't allowed to eat. They, right? Anyone who's not forced not to be able to eat, unfortunately, gets rail thin, super thin, very unhealthy. So you would get to a place where you would be have no skin and bones or is no skin and fat on your body if you depleted enough. Of course, that's not what we want. That's never what we want. And again, I know a lot of our goal is to go for longevity, is to maintain lean muscle. And so what we talked about at the beginning, where we're just doing it nice and slow, where we're keeping our other targets in our brain about the types of foods that we're going to choose to eat while we begin to reduce our body fat percentage and make it in a pattern that's sustainable for the long haul. I think that is crucial. Uh, crash dieting, of course, involves severe calorie restriction, leads to rapid weight loss, but it's not sustainable. All right. So it's something that we definitely don't want to do as it can cause muscle loss and a decrease in nutrients or have a, allow you to have a nutrient deficiency, which is what we don't want. All right. Conclusion, fat loss is complex and it involves creating a calorie deficit through a combination of diet and exercise. A lot of effective strategies can include things like calorie restriction, high protein diet, resistance training, high intensity intervals, and getting enough sleep. It is also essential to avoid common misconceptions like spot reduction or crash dieting and thinking that cardio is so much more effective and not including any resistance training. I think a combination of both is important. And again, when we talk about cardio for fat loss, we're going to visit the types of cardio that might be important for you to follow. So following these strategies might help you begin to reduce your own body fat percentage. All right. Thoughts or questions? Is this something that you're jonesing for right now? Are you trying to lose body fat? Um, and if so, do you have a question for me about that? Stacy says she fidgets all the time. Yeah, that, you know, for me, the adding the walking in daily has been a game changer. I kid you not. I think, I feel like I can kind of have my cake and eat it too. When I do my resistance training, maybe have one or two sort of I usually do a cardio and strength mix where it's high intensity, you know, kind of like today's circus circuits, if you did that one. Uh, and then strength on the other days and then walking and just fidgeting and standing desk. I feel like it's really helped my body use the energy that I eat <laughs> and I don't restrict myself, you know, well, I shouldn't say I don't restrict. I'm always conscious about the foods that I'm eating. I'm constantly, my meals are always really healthy because again, I've got a target for longevity and brain health and gut health. So, you know, I'm big salads. I've got my lean protein. And besides, those are the foods that make me feel really good as well. But I'm also, you know, having a cookie when I want to have it or having an ice cream bar when Quentin brings them home or, you know, having... um whatever it is that I enjoy. So I'm not restricting in a way that says, oh, I'm never going to have those things again, because I don't want to live like that. I don't want to miss out. But also, you know, I've learned how to incorporate really good swaps that will help keep the calories lower or the glycemic index lower so that I can manage those insulin spikes. And that helps me, you know, stay at the same weight for the last 30 years. Um, but it's, it's like the full package. You kind of, you can't really stop doing any of it, <laughs> which can be tiring for us sometimes. And I think, you know, sometimes we're in a season of our lives where it's all we can do, you know, just to exist because maybe relationships are failing or maybe jobs are too stressful, or maybe we're having to take care of aging parents, or maybe our kids are stressing us out. And so, 
you know, we do go through seasons where it's more challenging than other times. But I think when you build the foundations and you understand what makes you feel good, moving your body daily, getting that good sleep, drinking the water instead of alcohol, eating foods that nourish you, you're going to come back to those things time and time again, and you're going to feel better because of it. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. All right, just uh, looking at the uh, comments again. Uh, boobs first, bum last. <laughs> yeah, boobs are fat. I know my daughter wanted a boob reduction because her boobs are so big. And I'm like, you know what? Just keep them for a while because uh, as you age and if you reduce in body fat percentage, you're, you, they'll be gone. Boobs are fat, I know. That's true. Uh, what would be a good bed, benchmarking measure for fat percentage? Do the fat weighing scales actually work? Well, there's always a margin of error with the scales for sure. But you know what? I think they are good in the sense that you're measuring yourself against yourself this day over that day, right? So it gives you a gauge, you know? So I think it's, it's good. Um, a good benchmark for measuring fat percent. I've actually got... There's, there's a chart under the files, Emma, that you can take a look at. Uh, I'll have to maybe just go and see what it's called and then I can write it down here. Um, oh, I've got my computer right here. Uh, it, anyway, it's a file and it's about body fat percentage. I did a whole thing on that not too long ago. Yeah, okay, it's about 10 down under files at the top of the page and it says body fat percentage in women. Uh, that'll give you a good idea of where to be, okay? What net carb amount increases sugars? What net carb amount increases sugars? Oh, I'm not sure I understand that sentence. What net carb amount increases sugars? Uh, net carbs are your amount of carbohydrates minus your fiber amount, and that's your net carbs. Uh, what amount increases sugar? I don't know what that means. Try to help me understand what you're mean by that. Um, I never thought about what type of weight I want to lose. I just want to look like the way I look in the mirror. You know what? Have you ever heard that adage that if you want to like what you look like in the mirror, do resistance training. And if you want to look good in clothes, do cardio. <laughs> That's an old like adage, you know, but it's true. I, I agree. Like if I want to like what I look like in the mirror without clothes on, uh, I'm doing resistance training. I'm sculpting, right? I'm building muscle in the shoulders. I'm building muscle in my glutes. I'm sculpting the body and shifting the composition. Uh, I really find that once women start lifting weights and being dedicated to that process, it changes their whole composition. And by and large, it seems like the majority like that look better than the skinny fat look. Yeah. Okay, I'm going down questions here again. When I tried to lose fat before, I added a daily indoor jog in addition to my move daily workout. You really made a difference. Yeah, exactly. It's And so there it is for Kim. Uh, so Kim is a vegetarian, which means a lot of the calories she's going to eat also include carbs, right? So a lot of the protein, sorry, that she's going to eat includes carbs because chickpeas, black beans, you know, quinoa, while they're high in protein are also high in carbs. So she might have that additional energy source in her body. And so what is going to help her offset that or what's going to help her burn it? And that additional indoor jog did exactly that. It used up all of that energy and, and some probably because she may have been in a calorie deficit and then she was able to really burn off any additional fat there. So yeah, that does make a big difference when we add those little extra things, right? Uh, for me, it's the, it's the hill climbing outside, the walks outside. You know, I'll look at my watch. I'm like, whoa, that's an additional four or 500 calorie burn for today, which is substantial. That's the deficit that I need right there. Okay. Holly says, when choosing a piece of bread, what net carb amount should I aim for that would spike sugars the least amount? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, oh, you're asking for a number. I'm not certain, Holly. Sorry. Uh, but... So I think, here's the factors, what would help offset the spike is if it had fiber in it. So if you had plus three grams of fiber, so anything over three grams of fiber would help substantially. As we know, fiber digests slower in the body and helps 
helps offset those spikes. However, if you ate just the bread by itself, you're still probably going to get some sort of glucose spike. It's different for every body, but what would be helpful is if you added a protein and or healthy fat to that bread. So having a little bit of nut butter or avocado with an egg on top is going to definitely offset uh, the, the spike in your glucose if you did that. So, or even having the egg first, right? Eating your egg and then having your piece of toast or bread is going to do the same thing. So I'm not sure if you follow the glucose goddess, but implementing those little hacks and she has all these little charts on her Instagram, which is so helpful because you can see, okay, this does that. But if I pair it like this, it does that, you know, it's not near the spike. Again, it's going to be different for everyone, of course, right? And it, it's different depending on where your estrogen levels are at, right? What your body's going to do. Uh, if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, what your body's going to do. So take that all with a grain of salt. But it is interesting to see. You can get your own glucose monitor. Uh, I had a company ask me if I would, um, they could sponsor me, but I wasn't really in it to win it at the moment. Uh, it's just... Anyway, I didn't want to do that partnership, but you get those continuous glucose monitors and they're really popular right now. A lot of people are doing that where they just have a little monitor and they test things. Actually, I follow this guy on, I don't know, TikTok maybe, and he's constantly testing different things. I'm going to test these French fries. I'm going to test this. It's lots of crap foods that he's testing, but when he eats things that are high in fiber or paired with protein and fat, you don't see that spike as much. Your shoulders are goals. Oh, honey. <laughs> I'm with you there. What amount of complex carbs do you suggest? Um, you know what? For fat loss, I like to keep that number personally. And it depends on how what your size is, how large you are now, like your height, weight, all of that makes a difference. But for me, I aim for around that 100 grams a day, which is not terribly high. Okay? So... I sort of think in terms of I want to get 100 grams of protein, maybe 100 grams of carbs. And that, when I'm thinking in fat loss, that is a good strategy for me. When I'm thinking for muscle growth, those carbs would be higher and that protein would be slightly higher as well. Uh, you said, you said Tracy Steen before about putting clothes on your carbs is cottage cheese on toast. Yes, cottage cheese on toast is clothes on your carbs. Absolutely. And it's yummy too, so that's good. I would do like, um, I've done that before actually, because I'm, well, there's so many cottage cheese recipes right now, it's kind of viral. Um, but I do love mixing cottage cheese and yogurt together with berries and cinnamon and protein powder. Mm, that's like one of my favorite things. But even uh, having sourdough bread, which is fermented and good for gut health, and then putting like avocado, uh, cottage cheese, egg, and sauerkraut on top. Mm. <laughs> I love that. That's a good combo too. Anyway, okay, I've kept you long enough. Thanks for joining. Uh, go move daily in your nutrition now. Make wise choices. And again, uh, feel free to look into the files. There's lots and lots of files there that you can take a look at and get more information on topics like this and more. And then under the guides, previous coaching calls, lots and lots under your fitness, wellness, and nutrition. So take a look there as well. Very good. Thanks everyone. See you in the next coaching call.